Okay, great. Okay, I'll follow you. Okay, bye. Um, you may be now. I hope it all goes smoothly from now on. So I can see lots of lovely names here, people that I recognize. Uh, I would love to see a few more faces. Um, I mean, the ones that I do see are high quality faces, but um, um, a few more wouldn't hurt. So if you feel like revealing yourself, please do. Uh, so we start at the beginning again, as every year, except that we never start at the beginning for some reason, the way the calendar works out. We always start with destruction rather than creation. That's that's how we teach the, the teaching year, which is, of course, off. That's not the way it should be. First, there was Vayom Avrayehi. The first God said, spoke, and there was. Things came into being. And then there comes the tragic moment at the end of last week's parsha. Right? It's a kind of a kind of hinge moment that we are even in the parsha of creation, we already have God regretting Hashem, and God regretted that He had made the human being in the world. The interesting thing is that even though God at this point already decides to wipe out uh, the world in the Parsha of creation. Uh, nevertheless, the word Hashem is used rather than Elohim. Yeah, Vayar Hashem ki Hadam The end of the end of the of, of a Parsha creation. Why is Hashem used over and over again? Well, after all, we are talking about Midat Hadin. We are talking about harsh judgment. But it's as if in this pivotal passage which I want to look at more closely in a few minutes. In this pivotal passage, the God we're dealing with is here in that version of himself that has been there throughout the creation story. The Hashem version, after, that is after the first chapter. Once Adam, once Adam appeared on the, on the scene, it was always Hashem, Hashem Elohim, but not just Elohim. So that carries on through God's first statement of his disappointment and his plan to wipe out everything that he has created. Vayit atsev Hashem, that most painful and uh, disturbing expression, and God was pained. God in some way, and I want to look into that word in a few minutes, but before we go into the details now, I want to say something about the title of the course. Um, about my ambition for the course, uh, which I am feeling quite insecure about. <laughs> the question of the Torah as poetry. Now that sounds very, uh, you know, kind of, kind of haughty, uh, a grandstanding kind of declaration that the Torah is poetry. That is, kol ha-Torah, not just the poetic passages, not just shirat hayam, you know, that's obviously poetic passages, but the whole Torah. So I wanted just to trace the geology of that idea, to look back in, at, at, at its beginnings. Where, where, it, where did it come from? And that's what you have in one and two on your page. Um, there has been a little bit, another bit of a, a problem. Um, in the Hebrew, uh, I added these two, these two passages, and then I renumerated all the others so that it reads one after the other in Hebrew. In English, if you look, you'll see it's one, two, and then one again. It starts with one. So we'll always, if you're reading the English, you always have to add two in order to see what I'm referring to. I'll try and remember to, to say it as well. In other words, it's not quite in, in, in sync, but um, but I think we'll, I think we'll manage. Uh, technical difficulties were just too much for me. Um, but uh, Shira, let's have a look at number one. This is from right at the end of Sefer Devarim. Again, a hinge point, right at the end of Sefer Devarim, at the end of the Tochacha. 
Anochi haster astir panai bayom hahu. On that day, terrible predictions of the future. I will indeed hide my face. Al kol hara'a asher asa, because of all the evil that the people has done. Kipana el Elohim achilim, that they turned to other gods. Now that is just a kind of lead in, just to show you the juxtaposition. There will be that terrible, ruinous state of the hiding of God's face from the world at some point in the future, if. And then suddenly a switch, but now, as if it's some, some kind of reaction to this idea. You write for yourselves this song and teach it to the children of Israel, Sima Bafihem, put it in their mouths. So teach it, teach it to them, teach it to teach them to sing it, teach them to recite it in their mouths. This should it's an oral, it's an oral communication. And it is, it's called a shira. In order that this song should be for me, says God, a witness against the children of Israel. That's a difficult expression. Um, the Hermic Davar has a very interesting discussion of what is meant by saying that the Torah is Shira. At, at first sight, we think that the words of this song, the Pshat would be, the obvious meaning would be to refer to Parshat Ha'azinu, which is just about to follow, which is a song. That is in poetic form. And the most obvious reading is that that's what God is referring to. Now, here is the last commandment of all. Actually, this is the, this is the end of the Torah. Uh, and the last commandment is to write Shirat Ha'azinu, write the song of Ha'azinu. But in, in relation to this, then, the Gemara in Sanhedrin and in other sources and the Rambam, say no, the, the expression Hashira Hazot doesn't refer just to this narrow thing, the, the song of Hazinu. it refers to Kol HaTorah, to the whole Torah. That's what you are to teach and put in their mouths, that in some way, the whole Torah is Shira, song, poetry. I'm not going to try to nail anything down at the moment, because I'm taking, I'm taking a kind of long view of this challenging subject. I don't want to start with definitions. One could easily spend a whole, our whole time offering various definitions of poetry, of what is poetry, and trying to see how, in some sense, that fits, that fits uh, the, the Torah Kula. What the Gemara in Sanhedrin says, this teaches you that every person has to write his own Sefer Torah. It's a very halachic, concrete application. What you learn from this is to write not just the song Ha'azinu, but the whole Sefer Torah for yourself, right? It says, Kitvu Lachem. Every person has to write it for himself, even if he has inherited a Sefer Torah from his parents, from his ancestors. In other words, you have one in the house. Nevertheless, it's a positive mitzvah, and it's the last mitzvah in the Torah, and it relates to the whole of the Torah take that whole Torah and write it as a song, as something you will relate to as poetry. And there are no explanations given. It's a fairly technical context. Right? You know there's another mitzvah to write for yourselves. Every person has to write for themselves. But there's no theoretical discussion of the concept of Shira in the Torah itself or in the Gemara. But the Hemic Devar, writing in the 19th century, has um, an extraordinary introduction to the whole Torah before Parshat Breshit, before Sefer Breshit. And in the third section of that, I don't, uh, I'm, I didn't put it on your page. Um, in the third section of that, he raises the question. He lives in the 19th century. Poetry has a very live existence in the world uh, at that point. And what can it mean to say that the Torah is poetic? There must, obviously the Torah is not in poetic form. The classic poetic form is parallelisms, first half of the Pasuk, then mirrored by the second half of the Pasuk. It's clear signs of the form of poetry. That the whole Torah is not written that way. So it's not a formal idea. It must be something to do with the very nature of poetry, he says. The very nature of poetry, and here's where I'm trying to avoid two two clear definitions. 
What he says is this, is that the language of the Torah, enenu mevoar yafe, a strangely negative description. The thing about the language of the Torah is it is not clearly explained. It's not self-explanatory. You can read the Torah and have a very distinct feeling that you're out of your depth. That there are many things you don't understand. And that this is Torah Shabbat Shalom. This is the written Torah, which you would think would be the most clear version of Torah. Torah Shabbat Pel, the oral law, is when we, you explicate and, and elaborate. And it, that might be unclear. That is complicated and, and intricate. No. It's just the opposite. He says that's the pshat of the whole Torah as Shira, that it's not completely understood by the reader. And therefore, there's something intricate, there's something elusive about the expressions, the language of the Torah, which means that you have to work at it. You have to work at it, let's say, by interpretation. Nothing comes you know, clean and clear to you which of course we might be tempted to think is the, is the essence of communicative language. Isn't that what language is supposed to be about? And so you don't, you don't have to, you don't know no ambiguities left, you know exactly what you have to do. That may be true for certain kinds of activities. You know, if you are, if you're reading a technical handbook, you would want the language to be as clear as possible. That's prose, prose. But uh, the Hamid Davar says, no, this is Kola Torah Shira, which means that in some way it's deliberately obscured. That it's not in the lucid light of day. So what do you need? On the one hand, you need to know a lot. If you know a lot, it's like having a set of footnotes to the Torah. Then you know what some of the expressions that are used in the Torah refer to by referring to other verses in the Torah or to places where the theme is a little hidden. And so you can connect the two places if you know enough, if you have learned, uh, if you have learned what, what the Midrash has to say, what the Talmud has to say, you've got it all, you know, under your belt. Then there's a tremendous pleasure and he calls it a mitikut. I like the expression. It's a sweetness for someone who has knowledge to read those cryptic expressions, those expressions that are fraught, that are heavy with a, with a, with a freight, of a somewhat mysterious freight, and to decode them, that you, you know enough to be able to read according to Hazal, according to Rashi, according, you know, you are very knowledgeable. Now, he more or less stops there, and he doesn't include in his understanding of the Torah Ashira, the other possibility, what, what might be left over, even if you know what the official translations all have to say, maybe there would still be room for interpretation. And that, that is something that I think the Hamik Devar is on, this, is on the outskirts of saying that. He's just skirting around the point. But there is something perhaps in his traditionalism, in his sense of the right way to read, that doesn't allow him to be as free as that. To, to say that basically in the end, you still have written words and written words perhaps by their nature always will beg for interpretation. Written words and oral words. And then, you know, it's up to you then to some extent when you write the Torah to have the sweetness of the footnotes, you know, that you, you, you know what it all means. But beyond that rather obvious pleasure, there is a different kind of sweetness which comes from applying yourself, lachem, kitfu lachem, applying yourself to the task of reading, which means to some extent, bringing yourselves to the text, bringing with all the, 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 the liberating dangers that that, that, that might, might suggest. And so what, what we have here then is the Hemik Davar being, talking about implicitness, uh, the implicitness of language, that language and the language of the Torah as poetry, particularly, has this sense of much implied, but not everything said. And then the first stage in dealing with that is simply to learn a lot, 
<laughs> to learn, to try to understand, to see the connections between, as in any good, good edition of Shakespeare, you'll have all the historical references that explain the cryptic, the cryptic lang language of Shakespeare. And you would be foolish not to take advantage of that. But there could be a quite different, uh, a quite different motivation in, appro in approaching the text than simply to find out very clearly and very explicitly what at that time did God mean when he said, when he wrote that. Maybe in the end, that is the less important of the tasks that, that is in front of us. And I want to, before we move into Parashat Noach, I want to, to give a, an example, perhaps two examples, of where the, of where the Hermic Davar, the Metziva Volozhin, late 19th century, uh, commentary, Rosh Hashiva of Volozhin, a true Litvak, yeah, a true Lithuanian scholarly Jew, where he applies this principle in his close readings. Uh, I bring them, even though they're from last week's Parsha, partly because I can't not talk about last week's Parsha, and partly uh, because they are so inviting, they're, they're so striking. Vayihu shnehem arumim it's the end of chapter two of Breshit. Just before the sin, there's a comment made about how the two of them, man and his wife, were naked, naked and they were not ashamed. Now that, again, it's a, a, a negative statement to point out to the reader, you know, Adam and Chava were qualitatively different from us. That when we regard na nakedness somewhere as a cause for modesty, for, for covering up. That's somewhere inherent in our societies. But they, they didn't have that. They were not ashamed. And, and leave you then to, to work out what, what do you make of that. And what the Hermit Davar says, he points out, well, it's a kind of technical observation, that the root of the word ashamed, bet vav shin, is not the same as the root of yit boshashu, which we translated, they were not ashamed. Boshesh and bosh are two different roots. Right? They share two letters, the bet and the shin, but they are different, they are different roots. And he now begins to play. Right? You see how in practice, he goes way beyond just consulting the authorities. No one says this before him, as far as I know. And he comes up with this extremely creative and endlessly fertile idea that what is we are being told here is that there's suddenly, after the sin, something new happens to Adam and Chava. What is the new thing? Before we get to shame, it's boshesh. What's boshesh? To be, to be delayed, somewhere to lag behind, not to be at one with yourself, not to be living in your own moment. Now, that's where how we are. At that time, they didn't have any of that boshesh, that jet lag, that time lag. What, what does that mean? And what he wants to say then is the word boshesh um, floods into the word busha. You know, it's somehow as if it releases fluid and, and the two words get joined. The two words get am amalgamated. They were naked means that they had no barriers dividing them from any relationship that they desired. The relationship between man and woman had no shyness about it. The body was not an obstacle. As soon as there was desire, there was union and there was no second thinking. There was no questioning oneself and, and asking oneself, is this the right thing to do? And should I be ashamed? And so on. So there's a kind of directness in the way Adam and Chava, the man and his wife, the two of them, even the emphasis on the two of them, as if they might even have been different one from the other, who knows? Reacting to the idea that you don't have a, a fully coordinated, clear, explicit meaning. You have a kind of fragmented meaning. Perhaps he was different from her, who knows? But certainly when it came to a bit, what they had before was a kind of, a kind of spontaneity, a directness of desire and fulfillment 
in relation between man and woman and in relation between the man and God, human being and God. That when it came, when one wanted to come close to God, when I wanted to, to be in, in close relation to God, there were no hesitations, no false modesty, no true modesty, no humilities, no, you know, none, none of the second guessing that we recognize very well in ourselves, that we have all kinds of questions, that we hesitate. We need hit ororut, he says now. We need arousal. That's a very powerful word. You know, in, in sexual terms, it's very clear what it means. And he is talking, interestingly, particularly about female sexuality. That's what I find so uh, extraordinary. Here, this 19th century of Talmud Chacham is talking about how there is a need for hitorarut, that the woman comes from the kitchen or wherever, <laughs> wherever she, the study, let's say. The woman comes from the study where she's been spending her, her time, and then there's the relationship with her husband. And she's not aruma. There is a busha. She's, she's still involved in her clothing. She's involved in her cultural trappings. She's involved in everything that causes her to some extent to be inhibited. There's a certain inhibition. And so there has to be a hitorarut. And the need for that arousal, that is, is what makes us shy. We wouldn't want to have anyone see that. You know, if we were just so direct and free, in a way, perhaps we would we wouldn't be shy because you know there would be no there would be no implications, uh, there would be no dubious questions around the issue. But because because there 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 now are these self questionings, there is shame, and the, and because there is the need for arousal, there is shame. And even when it comes to prayer. He will say, we need a certain sniut about prayer. And he quotes from the, the Talmud in Brachot that it's a chutzpah for someone to stand in the open field and just address God, you know, like the, like the innocent uh, little peasant in, in the Hasidic story, you know, who plays his flute without any inhibition at all to God, very sure that he's communicating with God and that he's achieved dvekut. That dvekut is easy to achieve. Well, you can achieve that perhaps if you're very simple, if you're a little primitive nowadays, but as soon as you are a cultured person, it's not so easy to achieve that. And that's the difference between them and us. Now that becomes much more complicated now than the simple idea that they were naked and not ashamed. And what he's done here is interpret. He's interpreted in a way that thickens the plot. Suddenly, the translation can't be simple. Uh, you notice, I, even as I try to talk about it, I, I feel a little pressure to, to get the right words out. And it's not, if, have I said enough yet to, to make clear what I mean? In other words, but there is, I would still say, there is a ta'anug. There is a pleasure about this kind of interpretation. There's an onik about bringing one's true human experience to, to play in translating the Torah and noticing complexity and intricacy in the language of the Torah and in the feelings that the Torah is describing, the humanity that's being described, suddenly it has, it's endowed with what we all know if we are at all aware in the world, what we all know about sexuality and coming close to God, right? But they're not simple. Nothing is, nothing is so simple. Um, uh, a similar comment uh, that he makes, uh, try to keep this more brief now, um, he makes about the moment where God accosts Adam and Chava in the garden and asks Adam, you know, how did you know that you are naked? How did you know that you are naked? No, I, I never told you that. Who told you that you are naked? And Adam answers, well, it's really all the woman's fault. Uh, she Right. How, how does he put it? Ha'isha um, shenatatabi. He blames God for giving him this woman. Yeah. He and she. 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 Uh, she listened to the serpent, and she made me eat. Va'ochel, and I ate. And the Hamid Davar points out, uh, and and others as well, his kunin, that it, what what Adam is doing here is not a simple. He, it's not either a simple confession. He doesn't report, re respond to God's question by saying, well, yes, I did disobey. 
and I ate of the fruit. And it's also not as simple just shifting the blame onto, onto his wife, onto God. He does both. That is, he has his, his basis covered. He both blames God and the woman, he tries to pass the blame onto them, and he confesses. And what I'm understanding from that is, again, that kind of complexity that human beings always have in whatever they say and write, right? Whenever they express themselves, whenever we express ourselves, we very rarely achieve that kind of, let's say, ethical simplicity. Just to say very simply, I was wrong. I was wrong. If you notice, ap apologies are notorious for that. <laughs> that you, you, you never apologize without explaining. You want the other person to understand why you did it. And in that way, you hold a few cards still close to your chest. You know, I, I still have something else to say other than I'm guilty. And that kind of twinness, that kind of twoness, that doubleness, right? That is what the Hermit Davar reads the Torah for. Once you say, va'ochal, and I did eat. And the Midrash already has it. I did eat and I will eat. What an extraordinary doubleness. At the moment when he is being forced to confess, it's a shameful moment. He says he knows himself on some level. There's a knowingness. He says, yes, I did do that. And you know what? I'm afraid what I did, I will always do. Once I've tasted, once I've tasted it, I will always want to know. I will always. So somewhere there's a kind of heavy self-knowledge there it's not it's not uh, it's not exactly chutzpah but it's a it's a certain a certain awareness of how we work that what is in the past tense will be in the future tense the vav hahipuch what we call the the conversive vav va ochel which takes the future tense ochel puts a vav in front of it and changes it into the past tense uh, i hope i'm being clear enough um, if you know grammar, then you'll know. If you don't, I, I feel bad if I'm not explaining it well enough. All right, ochel is the future tense, add a vav in biblical Hebrew, and you've converted it into the past tense. But if it's, you have converted it, it still retains its future tense meaning. Somewhere, implicitly, the grammarians might not agree with me, but somewhere you're still, you're, you've got that. So you never say things completely simply. There's something always ambiguous. Uh, T.S. Eliot says something uh, like this, but I, I wanted to point out not only about poetry, but about any kind of literary, literary production. That even as one is saying it or writing it, one may not fully understand what one is writing or saying that there's a kind of margin of mystery somewhere. Somewhere I am inspired, I am possessed. You know, it's certainly if it's poetry, there's a feeling of one's unconscious taking over to some extent, if you want to call it that. And the, and the sense therefore of not fully understanding perhaps anything, anything that one produces when, when the work of one's hands, yeah. one has made it, but one doesn't fully understand it oneself and one could even misinterpret it after afterwards you could look back at what you yourself have written and give a bad reading of it because you are not the balabayat you are not really in charge of your own product on some level that's its greatness that's the greatness of poetry of making the word poetry po 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 poesis originally in greek meant simply the act of creation the act of creating something, making something with your hands, and of being in some way then separated from one's own makings. That there's me and then there's what I've made. Have a look now at the Svatimet, number two on your page. Here addressing Noah and making a very similar comment about Noah. It says at the beginning of the Parsha, Ele toldot Noah. These are the descendants, let's say, of Noah. And in Rashi, you find a very loose understanding of the word toldot, descendants. Ikar toldotehem shal tzadikim, mitzvot umasim tovim. We're not thinking only concretely about your, the offspring of your body. We're thinking about your creations in the world. 
your cultural spiritual creations that is mitzvot and maasim tovim your ethical creations let's say that is what you have what you have taken of yourself and extended out into the world that's what is being born of you and goes out into the world and then he goes on to say this he wants to explain what these toldot are kol hanivraim shikhin la toldot all creatures animals too apparently have to make told toldot maybe not just for survival it's a, it's a kind of imperative they have to produce toldot why because god placed a, a a sacred point in every part of the creation the khalal habriya everything that god created had a kind of central core to it that was holy and it's the duty then of these created creatures and ibrahim a bifrat, bifrat bnei adam, especially human beings, but not only human beings, that's what's intriguing, that maybe even animals or maybe even non-animate creations also have an akuda kedusha, a holiness that needs to, it's, it's, it must, it must enlarge this and broaden it and bring it out into the world so that it spreads, it becomes more, that's toldot. You want to enlarge what is sacred in yourself and that you share that with all creation. There's a kind of movement towards extending the, the, the spark of holiness, yeah? the, 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 the mere core that God has placed. And that's called toldot. Call it mitzvot and good, and good deeds. All right. And then comes the paradox. All these uh, toldot, all these um, offspring, Offspring is pretty good translation because it does, it means everything that's no lad from you, which can be more than children, everything that has sprung out from you and spread out into the world, comes into being only by bitul, by a kind of constraint, by limiting oneself, which is the opposite of spreading oneself. And there is the paradox that he then goes on to write more about in the rest of in the rest of the passage. And, and then he goes on to say that when a person manages to manages to control his control his his life spirit, the spirit that wants to go out into the world and create and fill the world, pruruvu, be fruitful and multiply in more than a physical sense, right? That can only come into being if there's a certain restraint. Perhaps you don't get to produce offspring unless there's a certain discipline. You don't waste. You see, you know, I don't, uh, if, if, you, if you see what I mean, yes, you don't. You don't go around spreading seed all over the place. Yeah? And in some way, there's a sense of control, which makes it possible to produce meaningful offspring. And he says himself that it, it is a contradiction, but it's something that it, the more one understands it, the better offspring one can produce the more one understands that that's strange and how does one come to understand it if one is like a noah a noah playing with the name noah now really broadening again the meaning of of the verse which is just talking about a man called noah and saying noah was represented a kind of shabbat principle which is a principle of resting of control of not you know bouncing out into the world of not not vitality in a way a kind of manucha a kind of going to the root of his being co connecting with the root of his being um yishuf hadad a certain kind of calm each person connecting with the root of his being and understanding that in himself he has no vitality to make toldot that he needs something else in order to make Toldot. Call it God, yeah. that without God's help, he can't make. And so he, in a way, draws himself in to God before, reculer pour mieux sauter, the French have an expression for it, uh, to, to withdraw in order to leap forward the better. You know, it's been martial arts. You, know, you, you, you concentrate yourself, to the root of your being, to God, let's say, in the Kudakadusha, 
And from that point, there is a, a valid movement outwards. And of course, there are other languages one could use to, to, to express the same idea, but this is the language that, that he uses. And he just he ends by emphasizing again the paradox of bitul and his pashtut, of canceling oneself out in a way and spreading oneself out into the world, Mo moving out into the world. And that is the tension that Noah has to deal with. Now, let's now move into, into, the, into the story of Noah. First thing I want to say is that uh, Ella Toldod Noah comes after at the end of Parshat Bereshit. We're still, we're, still, we're still hanging around on the edges. Comes after at the end of, Par, uh, at the end of Parshat Bereshit. A pasuk it's perik vav pasuk gimo. Yes, perik vav pasuk gimo. Vayomer Hashem unsavory things are going on in the world. There's the, the sons of the gods, the daughters of man. I won't go into those those uh, mixtures of of human beings. And God said, Lo yadon ruchi ba'adam leolam mysterious we don't know what it means right how, how, how might we try my spirit shall not judge man forever what is that he is after all he is just flesh and so any number of interpretations many different interpretations it becomes highly ambiguous this this person could mean this could mean that Rashi says very simply, Lo yitra'em ve'yariv ruchi alai. I'm not going to go on forever in conflict with myself. What an extraordinary statement by God. God also is ambivalent. That is anthropomorphism. God who has made man as the work of his hands. Yeah. How did God make man? He took of, of the dust of the earth, and then there was some water, yeah. rain, and he molded man into a creature, a, a, a work of art. Yeah. Dust and water, like this baker, Rashi says, like a baker who takes flour and water and produces a beautiful challah. So Adam is like a kind of challah. He's a mixture of water and earth, and he's made directly by that great baker, uh, who is God. Yeah. That God, God has produced, and what has he produced? He's produced a human being who will always be ambivalent, who will always be in conflict with himself. Where does that come from? That too has a place. It's a very daring idea, but that, that's how Rashi translates it. Um, in a way, a version of God, if I can put it like that, a version, a turning of who God may be. It's not so simple to say that God is, you know, the, the theologically correct things. He is omnipotent and omniscient and, and all, all right, the philosophers might, might be happy with that. But God, passionately, passionately experienced is someone who also has ambivalences. As Rashi goes on to say, he's, he's in conflict whether to destroy them or to save them. What hmm. That's ambivalence, whether to destroy or to have mercy on them. Now that ambivalence of God, you know, he says, I can't go on with this for any longer. He says, Le'orlam. It's, it's enough already. I have to come to a decision. And coming to a, to a decision, and this is one of the, the strange things about God that you find in classic sources, not in Kabbalistic sources necessarily, that what did God do before he created this world? He was always creating worlds and destroying them. That is, God is a God who has those two sides to him. His creativity includes destructiveness. He would create a world, decide it's not good, he doesn't like it. And you can see the source on your page in number, um, hmm? 
Yes, number four. Number four are two. Uh, two, three, four. Source four um, in the Hebrew, anyway. Um, yeah, it's two in it's the two. English. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not capable of trans <laughs> of doing a subtraction of two from four. Amar Rabbi Abahu. Yeah, how do we know that God created worlds and destroyed them until he created this world? He said, and then he said, Tov Ma'od. And God saw everything that he had created. Everything means all those many worlds. Creating, destroying, creating, destroying, creating, destroying, which is what any creative person does. No? Terrible process. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a very difficult process. You know, is it good enough? Is this right? Is this right what I'm just working on now? Is this, does it? And that's the way it's put in here in the Midrash. Um, he looks at the, at the old worlds when he, and he, he doesn't like them. These are no good. It's almost like it's a matter of taste, almost a matter of aesthetic taste. He looks at them, no, they don't work. That, that, one, that version doesn't work. And until finally he looks at the world he created now, and he says, ah, tov mo'od. Finally, there's something that's very good. And it's read in that kind of colloquial tonality of the work of the artist who finally finds something that he likes. So a moment of relief. But that is the two-sided nature of God, of this, of this am am ambiguity. And that's what gets expressed in that strange expression, vayit atsev Hashem. And God was saddened right a few verses later uh, actually the next hmm? yes a few verses later pasuk zayin because of vav vayinachem hashem god read the previous verse god saw hashem that the evil of human beings on the earth is very great and all the inclination of the thoughts of his heart are only evil all day long that is all the living thoughts of his heart Right? His genuine thoughts are only evil. And God regretted, changed his mind, had a different thought. Rashi translates, I thought, I, I thought differently before. I liked it before, but now I no longer like it. But it, the way in which I no longer like it is very disturbing because I'm still the God who liked it. I'm still in a framework of chesed and rachamim. And then suddenly I, I'm not at ease. So I'm still, Hashem is still Hashem here. He's not, he hasn't converted entirely to being Elohim, to being the God of justice. This is a, it's a subtle point that I want to make because Rashi makes it. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a very powerful point. Later, when the flood is in full force and everything is being destroyed, suddenly we read, Vayiskor Elohim. Elohim is used all the way through the destruction, the God of just judgment, harsh judgment. But when God suddenly remembers Noah and decides I have to, I have to do something to help him, in other words, it's, there's a thought of, of compassion, he is still the God of Elohim. That is, what is happening here is that this is a kind of the swinging point. One, there is a world that is in place at this point, which is at the first, it's a world of Rachamim and Chesed, creation. God liked. God liked what he had done. And suddenly comes this disturbing, this pivoting point. But I don't like what's going on here. And God is still Elo uh, Hashem at that point, And only afterwards, in the, in the actual destruction, he becomes Elohim. He converts. He swings over. He turns into another version of himself, which is Midat Adin. And he's still in that mode when he decides to look again at Noah. And then things change again. Now, that sense of a dynamic, that it's not just a kind of computer, you know, bringing out the data, you know, destruction, creation, destruction, creation. It's, it's a God who likes or doesn't like. What's, what's going on here? And I, I, this Vayit Atsev is, na, is now applied and, uh, to have, have, a look at, um, have a look at the sources you can see on the page. 
in um, number three, all, all four parts of number three. Let's, let's look at it quite quickly. What is this root, the Hitatsev? Is it he is saddened? What kind of sa sadness is it? And I want to point out, in case you hadn't noticed, um, that the word itsavon, which is not etsev exactly, it's a it's a product of sadness. It's a it's a more it's a more uh, nuanced version of of sadness. Occurs several times in the story of creation. Have a look at God's curse to Adam and Chava, to Chava. Harba arbe itzbonech. I will greatly increase your itzavon. And the word etsev is used only afterwards for, if you look at Rashi's uh, explanation here, how we don't understand what this means. Is there a difference between itzavon and etsev? Why use both expressions? Uh, and so Rashi says here, itzavon ze tsar gidul banin. That is the pain of raising children. But etsev is the pain, more obvious physical pain, of bearing children, which is what, how we usually read the pasuk. How, how uh, you know traditionally Christians have read the pasuk, and so they had doubts about about uh, the the validity of, of pain control uh, in childbirth, as if this is a curse. It's literally a curse. At any rate, what I wanted to point out is that. That is the obvious meaning of the, of the pasuk: the pain of childbirth, the pain of <coughs> of pregnancy, the difficulty of pregnancy. <coughs> but it's Savon is not that obvious thing at all. It's the complicated pain of raising children. Why? <coughs> because you had a dream of a toldot of toldot. You had a dream of you had a project. This is this child is going to be just like me in all the best parts of me. And suddenly you find out what you've produced is a very complicated, very complicated being. And there's a feeling somewhere of being thwarted. One's creative energy has turned out to be more murky than one had hoped it would be. Now that in relation to having children, right? That's just in that particular very important area of a human life you know, of human beings' fruitfulness in the world, which at first is such a triumphant thing, pru or de vu. And then it turns out there is an itzavon about what we have made, about, about things. There is no successful poem. Can I say that? Uh, that uh, that's a notion that not, more than one poet has, has, has put into words, that one is never happy with one's poem. What one hoped for was much bigger than that. And somewhere you have to accept the, the complexity of, of what came out. And so there is that kind of complexity. Have a look also at the next source. The Achalta et Esef Asadeh, the curse to Adam. <coughs> what kind of curse is this that you shall eat of the grass of the field? After all, it's part of a blessing. <coughs> Sorry about this. It's all the fault of my offspring. My children and grandchildren came to visit me with a bad cold. Not, not um, COVID, they assured me. Um, but I managed to, to, to get a bit of what they had. Oh, I'm sorry. After all, it's part. It's a blessing. I'll give you all kinds of vegetation and things that grow from the seed of the ground. So, what? Why is it as described as a curse? And what does it actually mean? The, cur the ground will be cursed because of you. It's a von tochlena. You will eat it in it's a von. That's what the Torah says. What is it's a von? Midrash translates, Rashi translates, it's a situation 
where you plant all kinds of good stuff, vegetables and, 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 and grains and all the things that you, you're planning to have your, your nourishing meal, and it brings up thorns and thistles. In other words, it's a one is the mental, emotional experience of having had an intention in creativity, let's save, it's all maybe connected even with the word let's save to design something. I designed something and it disappoints me. What I get back, I spoke to the world through my creativity. I spoke to the world and it talked back gibberish to me. It gave me all these thorns and thorns and thistles. So that's a kind of creative disappointment. It's a cre disappointment about that, that margin between creation and destruction. And as for God's, as for God's disappointment, by Yitat Sev El Libo, Dalid, all right, three, um, source three, the fourth section. Uh, he mourned, it's an expression of mourning, like the previous ones, mourning the loss of a project, the loss of a vision, the loss of what was supposed to be. So that kind of, that, so even God does that, right? So suddenly we share this with God, in this kind of use of imagination, right? Imagination is being used here in very organic ways. We recognize ourselves in God. God is connected to us in a very core way. It's not, it's not a superficial thing at all. But you that save a libo, and his hands were at work. And I want to say something about the hands now. Um, the fourth source is what the number, um, the third part of number three, Rashi on Hey uh, Kaftet, when Lemach had Noach as a son, Lemach was is Noach's father. What did we read? The father named the son Noach because he said, Zayi nachamenu mima'asenu u'me'itzvon yadenu. This one will save us, will give us relief, Rashi translates. Not comfort, yinachamenu, but yaniach mimenu, Noach. Call him Noach because he will give us Noach from all the frustration of the work of our hands. Why? And here is where you have this extraordinary suggestion in Rashi. Yaniach <clears throat> mimenu, um, God will, that in fact what happened was that Noach was going to invent the plow. That's what his father expected of him, that he would invent the plow and would now give relief to human beings who have to till the soil with their hands up to this point. That's the, that's the story we're being told here, that he wanted to produce not only children, as Ma Seya Decha, but also food to eat, you know, survival in the world, you know, love and work, or whatever, the two sides of, two sides of life, of productivity then you're going to have to use your hands. And the, your hand is that part of your body that's an extension of yourself. And it, it, it allows yourself out into the world. You move out from yourself, from your heart out there. So that kind of extension of yourself. And isn't it wonderful? Noah will save us some of this very hard work of plowing the ground with his hands um, by in technology. He's going to invent new technology, which will be an extension of our hands, the work of our hands. So this is a technology that's not a cold, heartless technology. This is a technology that's really an example of how human beings make toldot. That there's something human, like, like the hand, right? The hand comes, goes out into the world and touches things. There's something erotic about the hand. And in, when you have an extension of your hand, that is all kinds of technology. For instance, um, this is a, a passage in a, in a wonderful book, Gailene Scarry, who's a contemporary philosopher. And she talks about how it was recognized early in human civilization that the mark of a creative human being is not the skull, but the hand. It's the hand that is in intimate contact with the world that is not me out there, you know, molding the dough, 
you know, making things of, of the world. And it's the hand that then extends itself, makes itself even more powerful and overcomes all kinds of limitations by producing, for instance, an asbestos glove, a baseball mitt, a pencil, a scythe, in other words, I'm overcoming the limitations of the fact that I'm going to be burnt if I get hold of this hot material, you know, and try to mold it. But if I have an asbestos glove, my hand can come in contact with the world and, and make something good. Oh, it, similarly, a baseball mitt, the, uh, the, the, the pressure of the, of the ball could crush you, but you've got a mitt on and, and you, can, you, can, you, can, you can do what you have to do, and so on and so on. Apparently, um, I liked this one, Alexander Graham Bell, who was a Scottish, I will, I will have you know, a Scottish inventor, uh, invented the hearing aid to help people who are hard of hearing. And that developed into the phone, the telephone. He then extended it to something that you, people who are not right there with you altogether will be able to, to hear you. Now, that kind of movement of the hand lovingly out into the not the not a cold hand, vulnerable hand. It's a hand that can be disappointed. You know, you're you're creating with it. You're touching things with it. Um, Keats, the poet John Keats, has a wonderful line in one of his poems when he says, "When this warm scribe, my hand is in the grave, is in the grave." Then you, it will meet your hand. Centuries later, it will meet your hand. My writing, my scribe, I'm, I, what, I'm, what, what is this warm hand doing? It's overcoming the limitations of my mortality. And you will touch it with your hand. Right? There is that kind of really shivery uh, idea. You know, there's something very slippery about how language is being used here. But the slipperiness is what gives it its power. It gives you the sense somewhere of putting something out into the world that will never cease. You know, that's the, the dream. I don't know if Keats was disappointed with his own poetry, but he certainly recognized the, 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 the strength of what, of what he was able to achieve. That kind of hand, says the philosopher Heidegger, is very different. He says it couldn't be more different. Um, infinitely different from all grasping organs, paws, claws, fangs. In other words, we don't have paws and we don't have claws and when we gnash our, you don't have the, the uh, um, where the, what's the name of that children's story? Where the, right, the terrible things. Or where the side the wild things are. Again? Where the wild things are. Thank you, where the wild things are, right? right. They're, they're, these terrible creatures are really fearful. Their creativity is something to, be, to worry about. They're gnashing teeth and grrr, grrr, grrr. And Heidegger says, but here the human hand and the, the metaphorical use of the human hand, I mean, what the metaphorical use really expresses imagination. It expresses the human mind. It expresses human thought and its contact with other minds who are, who are not here in space and not here in time. And, and that, so there's something very warm about this scribe, this, this, this scribe that is, is the hand. It gives a hope of survival. Here I want to turn to the next question about Noah. Noah might have prayed for his generation. The Zohar makes that the heart of the story of Noah, that he didn't do what in later generations Avraham will do for Sodom and Moshe will do for his people. When he hears about disaster, he doesn't just obey God. I'm sorry that Noah does just obey God. Now there's an ambiguous pasuk. It sounds in praise of Noah. He's a tzaddik. He did whatever God told him. It says it twice. 
but never once does he speak. Never once till the very end of the story when he's blessing and cursing, and interestingly, never once does he speak. He is silent, particularly when he might have made a difference. And the Zohar calls that tefillah. That what he should have been doing when God told him, the end is, up, is, is upon us, is upon you, is put in a good prayer. And there's a wonderful play on words in the Zohar, which I can't resist uh, sharing with you. Um, when it comes to Moshe, you remember God says to Moshe, and Moshe starts defending the people, or he's thinking about it, one, maybe just the germ of a thought. And God says to him, just leave me alone, let me be, and I'll destroy this people, and I'll make another people from you, personal toldot from you. They'll be your pure offspring, not this mess that we have here. Just let me be. And so the Zohar says, Noach me. Now, what gives you the right to do such a thing? You know, it, it's very far from what you might call pshat. And yet, in a sense, if you think of the Torah as poetry, it's pshat. And that's what the Hermit Dhamma says. Don't think of this as a drush. It's, it, it's pshat. It's shot that the words contain, the words contain a certain kaleidoscope of meanings. Now, it seems to me this is true of all language, that you never fully and finally understand the meaning of a word. And perhaps I would, my instinct is to say, especially Hebrew, there's something about the Hebrew language that lends itself to this kind of shape-shifting, that it connects in different ways and it takes on different colors. Here, what sounds like in praise of um, in praise of Noach is actually to his discredit that he was responsible for the destruction of a generation. And Moshe says to God, don't tell me to be Noach. If, if I am Noach, then people will say I killed Israel like Noach. That is by passively accepting your decree without speaking without praying, then that's already murder. Now that very harsh judgment is made of Noah through Moshe. Then Moshe is pointing up the difference. But the, the plot thickens. We can say that was a failure on his part. Why did he fail to pray? Why did he fail to try to, to change things, to create, to take reality and mold it in some way? That's what tefillah does. Um, and, but the Orachayim, um, one, of, one of the great commentaries on the Torah, who is influenced by Kabbalah, says this. God made very clear to Noach when he told him, Kate's kol basar balefanei, the end of all flesh has come before me, and everything is already actually being destroyed. Everything is corrupted. Everything is falling apart. All solid objects are are, 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 are disintegrating, God is telling Noah, don't even try to pray. Now, this is an intriguing theme that I want to, to include as part of the weave today. That is, it could be when someone refuses to do the thing that then we're critical of him for, for refusing to do. It could be that there is a situation in the world there is a general situation in the world. God himself, satam et filato, is blocking his prayer. It's actually impossible to pray anymore in this given situation. It's too late. Th things have gone beyond the possibility of reversal. And that God is intimating that to, to, to Noah. And Noah is not criticized in this view. Noah is simply part of, it's a kind of, a kind of, um, a whole a whole world picture. A whole Noah's consciousness is part of a world consciousness that everything knows that it's too late now. Kate's called Basar Balefanai, or Chaim says, has come in front of me. In other words, I can no longer do anything about it. It's a fact. Kate's call Haolam. That that fatalistic. You want to call, that is the mode of destruction. 
That is the mode of destruction. And God has decided he swung over to that. What is it that a prayer at its best, in its right time, could do? Have a look now at, um, okay, number six. Number six, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak. Lama nimshala tfilatan shal tzadikim ka'atar. Why is the prayer of the righteous compared to a plow? Didn't know it was compared to a plow. Atar. This midrash relates to the words that's used of Yitzchak praying for his wife, Rivka, that she should be bare children. Vayetar Yitzchak. Very unusual word. And God, and he he overturned God in prayer, like a plow. La foch. To turn things over like a plow, so put here. Um, it moves reality around, it moves the produce around from one position to another position. The position of being deep down under the soil is brought up. That soil is brought up and is now on top of the soil. That's what a plow does and creates a fertile surface where there was a completely stony, destroyed surface, a ruined surface in which nothing can grow. So the, the way of the plow is to go in underneath and bring up something out of context in a way. The, the general surface context was one of destruction, of barrenness, of sterility. But then there is that vertical movement right, to bring things, something from one position to another position. And then that's elaborated. That's what the prayer of the righteous does. Changes God over from one posture to another posture, from one makom to another makom. It's, it's not easy to talk about these things. Um, I think only by only by feeling the words, I think, can, can we talk about it. That God is in different places at different times, like human beings. Sometimes we are, are in a place of chesed, and sometimes we are in a place of din. And, and we, we, we know it in some, very, in some very deep way. And that's what it means to change God. Now look at the poetry of that of that um, Talmudic passage. Um, what's, what's, what's the image there? God's din is a mode of anger. And God's rachamim is rachmanut. Why does he not just say, why do they not just say midat din to midat rachamim? Because it wants it to rhyme. Ragzanut to rachmanut. In other words, there is something about the words themselves that tell you what the slippery things you can do with language that you can take the word ragaz and change it into rachem, you know, by some kind of slate of hand. All right, the power of imagination, the power of speech, tefillah, to get in there and show the other side of things, to reverse things in some way. Poetry has that power and tefillah has that power. Um, poetry has that power. The Russian poet Mandelstam, uh, has a wonderful sentence in which he says, poetry is the plow that tears open and turns over time so that the rich, deep layers of it, its rich black, uh, its rich black undersoil ends up on the surface. Okay, sometimes he says mankind craves, mankind dissatisfied with his today and yearning for the deep layers of time, craves like a plowman for the deep virgin soil of time. Incredible metaphors there. That is, we are dissatisfied with the here and now, with the language that we have now, and we dig down to find the language of the past, to find a word that will suddenly transfigure that barren surface of language, which is the here and now. And that is a manipulation of time. 
And that's what God can do, and that's what man can do in, in a creative mode, in poetry and in tefillah. What was destroyed in the flood? It destroyed et ha'aretz, all the things, all, all creatures that lived on the earth, with the earth. Why with the earth too was destroyed? Because what was destroyed then, if you look at the end of the passage in number five, which is number three in English, et ha'aretz im ha'aretz, three cubits deep, the depths to which a plow goes in the earth were obliterated and disintegrated in the flood. That is, the flood destroyed that conversive power, that power to convert one thing into another. So that tefillah became impossible on, on, some, in, on some terrible level. It's, it's, uh, I, I, have, I don't want to, to try to, to, to translate it more than that. But the emphasis on the plow here, the plow which has normally that kind of magical power of the human imagination, the human mind, Okay, and one more source before we close in on the last part of what I want to talk about. Um, Adam. In the Garden of Eden, we read in Perik Bet, Pasuk He, here we are now um, on the sixth day of creation, and there was no vegetation yet, not yet, on the earth. Had not yet broken through, had not yet sprung forth. There were no tall dot on the earth. There was nothing, nothing had really happened yet. Why? Because God had not caused rain to fall on the earth. And so vegetation couldn't grow. And there was no human being to toil and to work the ground. So till the human being was born, this is the agricultural level of meaning, till there was a human being, and that has yet to be created. That's the next thing that's going to be created. Vegetation didn't obey God. God said it should bring forth grass. It's supposed to, that's its job, told it. And it did, but it st the creation stalled just at the surface of the earth. Right? The growth stopped right at the surface of the earth, says Rashi, and waited there for what? For rain and for Adam to work the earth. That's the physical labor of the hands, the physical labor. But Rashi's reading is very powerful. Till there was a human being, Adam Ayin, there is a nothingness of the human. There is a nullness of what we need from a human being, which is not just physical labor. It's someone who can be makir, who can recognize, who can think, who can know things about how important it is to have vegetation and that it's not here yet. Now, that is a very human capacity to look at a situation and say, what needs to be here is not yet here. A dayin lo. A feeling of chisaron, a feeling of deficiency, of lack, with the result of prayer. What does la avoda ta adama mean? To work the ground, the hands working the ground, the plowing of the ground. All that is a metaphor for a movement of the mind, of the imagination, that that can can come and pray basically that movement of prayer is what makes all the difference and in the end everything did come through <laughs> once once man was created in in rashi's source in uh, in the gemara in Hulin, what we find is uh, perhaps even turns the screw one more turn and that is that uh, what you learn from this is not the final achievement is not that the vegetation came through. The final achievement is that God desires the prayers of the righteous. In other words, God cultivates a not yet situation because that's what makes the righteous pray. That's what brings them past the threshold of 
it's impossible. There is nothing to do with this situation. Into the mode of not yet. Not yet means there might be a future. And that's what causes prayer. And what God wants, actually, according to the Gemara, is not just there should be lots of good vegetation in the world. The ultimate wish of God is that there should be a human being who has that power of a certain, a certain uh, wavelength of creativity that's called tefillah. And with this, I want to go uh, and look at Noah in the ark. Noah doesn't pray in the ark. There's no sign that Noah prays to get out of there. Does he even really want to get out of there? He's been put in a in an. I, I compare the ark um, a little imaginatively to a to a spaceship. You know, there he is in a place of destruction. The ark is one of the features of the destruction of the world. It's not a, it's not a bubble of life. There is no priya or ruvia going on in there. There is no, no fertility. There's no sexuality, right? It's a sterile interior, which is intended just for survival, which is part of the world of destruction, where everything is blocked. There is nothing coming out. Nothing is changing. And in, in that spaceship, as I call it, in which you would imagine at some point that there is a desire by the people in the spaceship you know, enough already. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to get back to Earth. I want to get back to life. Want, there is something unbearable about being in this very safe space which, in which there is no natural oxygen and no, no natural interactions and no in interchanges. Now, what, what you have then is Hashem says at one point, says to Noah, Bo el hateva. now it's time for you to come into the ark, you and your wife, Sorry, you and your children, and your wife and her children and, and her daughters. You and your sons and your wife and, their, and, their, and her daughters. Um, and that it tells Noah that being in the ark, being in this spaceship, being in this box, is means there will be no sexuality in the, in the ark. It's not you and your wife, the natural couple, but simply survival. You and your children and your wife separate from you and her children. God then, at the end, when God has remembered Noah and decides it's time to bring him back to earth, he says to him, Tse, Minateva. Now leave the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your daughters-in-law. And implying then, in this implicit way that language can be treated, the language of the Torah can be handled, that but simply by listing you together with your wife and your you and, and your sons and daughters-in-law together, the implication is that you are now returning to a world of sexuality. And if you have a look at the midrash, it's a very startling midrash, number eight. Sorry, number nine. Midrash starts by saying there is a time for everything, and a time for every object under the heavens. Yes. Quotation from Kohelet, there was a time for Noah to go into the box, into the spaceship. As it said, Bo ata el elateva. Zman hayalo min It was then there was a time that he should leave it, as it says, tse min hateva. What is this like? It's like a parnas, someone who's in charge of the administration and survival of a group of people. A parnas, um, who left his place, he went away from his place, and he he instated someone else in place of him, a, 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 a substitute. Then he came back, and he said to the substitute, "Now go out of your place." In other words, the position that you have adopted now, I've put you in here, you know that you should take over my role. Now I'm coming back to assume my role and you leave what you have come to think of as your role as the, as the administrator of this, of this uh, city. Um, so that happened to Noah. God said to Noah, go out of the ark. But he wouldn't go out. He, he refused to go out. That is, he held on to his place. He held on to this position in the ark, 
which means no relations with one's wife, which means, you know, no, no creativity, nothing, nothing being, there's something about it that he prefers over going, giving up this assumed place and letting God take charge again of the world. Right. God left that place. God doesn't have children. God, here the, the contrast is, 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 is emphasized that God can be in such a place. He doesn't need to sleep and he doesn't need to eat. And he just, right? So he can be in this kind of impersonal place in a spaceship. You now leave what you have become rather comfortable about uh, holding, which is a position inside the ark, a kind of sterile position. Why does he hesitate to leave it? He says, if I go and am fruitful and multiply, it will be a curse. In other words, it's just too dangerous to go back to that turbulent world out there where things change into other things and nothing is stable and everything is up for grabs. You know, everything is slippery. And then you look what happens to such a world. You know. So uh, there'll be another destruction. Of the so he feels the danger and the potential destruction that's involved in creativity. And he's holding himself safe inside the spaceship now. He says, that I, I'm not going out. Even if literally he does go out, right, according to the Pshat, he goes out without his wife. Right? When you read it, the, the narrative in the Torah, he goes out with his sons and he keeps the separation in place. As if to say, conceptually, I am refusing to think as someone who has returned to the world of creativity, world, world, world where things can change, right? To use it, with, to go into that world. And, and he resists God's command. Now that's his basic posture, according to this, according to this midrash. Have a look at number 10 now. A different position suddenly. Vayidaber Elokim El Noach, Lemor, Seimenateva. And God spoke to Noah. Remember, see, it's still Elohim. It's still from a position of Elohim. That, that's the only way Noah can think of God still, as the, as the God of destruction. And that that's somewhere how the world must be. But God speaks forcefully to Noah. This is the first Vayidaber in the Torah. Uh, whenever I say it, I feel I should check again. Um, <laughs> check yourself. Vayomer, Vayomer, Vayomer. But Vayidaber, that very forceful, controlled, God is saying to Noah, get out of the ark. And Noah responds by quoting from Psalms, Hotsiya mi masger nafshi lahodot et shimcha. Please let my soul out of imprisonment. Masger, the closed place. I am in a closed place. I'm in a locked, locked in condition. Please get me out of here. Now, what is the Midrash saying here? As far as I can understand it, I think what the Midrash is saying is that Noah, at this point, must have prayed a prayer. If God said to him so forcefully, say Minateva, it can only be because Noah has found in himself at least the vestige of a desire for a desire. A prayer for a prayer. He is praying, basically, and he says, let me out of here, out of this closed place. He's not just talking about the physical teva. He's talking about an uncreative place. He's talking about a place where he feels safe and he's in a way rather not get out of there. But he wants to hold on to some hope. You know, the, the, the erotic hand somewhere is reaching out here. And when he asks God, right, it's a pure creation of the Midrash, this. We have no evidence in the Pshat of the text that he asked to be let out. On the contrary, right? We saw, we saw that. But the Midrash now just makes it more elastic and says, if God said to him, get out, it must be. God doesn't just tell people to do things. It's interesting we're reading. It must be because something in you wanted it. There was a prayer. Maybe it's an unconscious prayer in you that I respond to by saying Samen. So there is this strange attunement between the divine and the human, as if they're, they're playing off each other. So you're not so sure where it begins and where it ends. Who is the creative force here that gets him out of the ark? Sounds as if God gets him out. But no, the Midrash is in introducing quite a plausible reading. <laughs> in terms of human nature, about how creativity behaves, the dynamic of creativity. 
that that at, there comes a point where one insists something in one thirsts for the power to pray, for the power to turn things over, that things that things should 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 should, should revert. There should be a different version, a different version of things. Um, the like the net, the number eleven. We have just five minutes. The Svatimet, on these words, Semenateva, says this. Noach is in a closed place. And he prays to get out in order in order to be in a position where gratitude becomes possible. Look at the, you see how winding it is? That is, I have a sense that I might be in a position yet where I can be grateful for something. And that is already a prayer. And so, and so the Sfatimit that goes on to say in general terms, I haven't got time to, to go into it as, as much as I would like. He says there are times and seasons. There are times for being closed and there are times for being open. There are times when the heart is closed and there are times and the gates of heaven are closed and there can be no prayer on both sides and there are times when things open up on the seventh day right the gate right the gate to the temple was opened up on shabbat it opened up on rosh kodesh it opened up there are other times when everything is closed and those are times of death he uses the imagery of death here and he says on shabbat for instance on shabbat we do praise god we say tov lahodot lashem it's good to give thanks to God. That's a psalm for, for Shabbat. And uh, and, and, and in Rosh Chodesh also, we say, Hallel, lo hametim yehalleluka. The dead can't praise God, can't give thanks. Those who can't give thanks have death in them. I can put it, yesh bo mita, he goes on to say. In the closed state, the fact that one is finite takes over. There is no room, there's no makom to be that other person. And then there is that flicker, that, that small movement towards life. And as you met, it's a matter of times and seasons. That, that the, there are days when you have to accept somewhere the close, the closure, and then and then the final moment is when God says, and I'll never do it again. Lo osif od. I will never again curse human beings, and I'll never again bring a bubble on the world, a flood on the world. It's, um, it's, uh, what, what pasuk? It's Perik. Yes. Perik Chet Pasuk, Pasuk Chavalaf. God smells the fine savor, the sweet savor of the sacrifice that in gratitude uh, Noah has offered up, Lohodot. And God says to his heart, to his heart, that, that interaction with his heart that started off as Vayitatsev el Lipo, God was disappointed and disillusioned in relation to his heart and said, There's nothing but evil. And now there's a more open mode of speaking to one's heart, of dialogue with one's heart in God. God said to his heart, Lo osif, I will never again curse. because I can't go into all of it. Lo, double, a double vow, a, a shvua. The, the Midrash reads it. Lo osif, lo osif is a vow. God vows never to bring a flood upon the, upon the world again. The, the why does he why does he refuse? No, let me put it like this. Um, who knows that God has refused, has made this vow? He's speaking to his heart. It doesn't say anywhere that he told Noah about it. But we do know about it because it's in the Torah. So maybe Moshe was told about it when the Torah was dictated to Moshe. <laughs> so Moshe knew about it. Right? That's that's a kind of rudimentary uh, interpretation. But what you have among the the line of the Ishbitzer, 
the Mashila, as a sense of a fine attunement between God and human beings. Again, where we are, he is, and where he is, we are. In some way that's very hard to speak of explicitly. You know, we, we, we talk about our freedom and we're there. So, of course, but there is something else going on. There's some kind of organic connection there. And what Mashalot has to say, and with this I'll have to finish, um, that this thought of God doesn't say it was made known to, to, uh, to Noah, but since Noah had so deeply impressed upon him by the mubble, by the, the flood, a certain kind of yura, a certain kind of fear of wanton expressiveness, of being out there, you know, that would lead to floods if he's out there in a kind of insanely unregulated uh, expression of self, you know, that kind of un, undisciplined expression of self. Be because he knew that in himself, that ingathering moment, that moment of, 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 of collecting himself and of controlling and reserving that, of, of restricting in some way, restraining his, his creative energies, because he knew it in himself, he could recognize it in God. That is, he had a very strong intuition that God has made a vow like that, because I am capable of imagining such a restraint. I'm, I am now aware of restraint in my own life and the way in which that can lead to a better form of Maseya Dain. And therefore, I know that that has something to do with God in the world, that there is a godly consciousness somewhere in the world. And even um, as the son of the Meir Shiloh goes on to say, the Beit Yaakov uh, goes on to say, uh, he says, right, you may think that's an, a normal, rational thing to say, that first the human being realizes, you know, what has to be in the world the way, and that's why he can project what he knows onto God, in a way. But he he's not willing to accept this, right? The son is more mystical than the father. Uh, it's a toldot. Um, and the son, the Beit Yaakov, says, no, it had to be God first. Everything is God first. God patach. God opened up in himself, and if he opens up, then the human being has a kind of intuition of something changing, and then that's the prayer to pray. You know, that's the beginning of a movement of some kind that can, between the two extremes of destruction and creation, somewhere God and human beings are in a way hand in hand. But there, there's some kind of touching of the hands. There's a, it's that connection, there's that tender, that kind of delicate connection that we've, we've been talking about. Um, do we have a little time for any questions? Sharona? Well, let's, 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 until someone stops us, if, if people have a question or a comment or something I missed. Viva, can I ask you something? Yeah, so, sure. Uh, Tell me who you are, just a minute. I'm Ruthie Shane yes, Ruth. from Baltimore. So um, I'm so impressed with the Zohar of the Hanichali, which is a which is uh, a kind of negative thing, you know, approach to it. And I I heard someone oh, must be he must have been speaking from his own mind because he wasn't quoting the Zohar, and he saw Hanichali as God saying to Moshe, "Be be a Noah for me," in the sense of. I will destroy the rest of the world. That is, I will destroy all of the Jewish people and I will make the, a new nation out of you, which is wow. what God is doing in yes. the story. Yes. He's yes. keeping yes. Noah and destroying everything yes. else. That's really, that's very good and very important. Yeah, because what it means again is that Noah is having his personal ego uh, restrained. Moshe restrains his personal ego to give, to give birth to himself, to the whole people here and Moshe restrains that and so on. that's what Noah did. Noah didn't mind the position on some level it was kind of safe to do it all by himself in the spaceship you know without having to deal with a wife and you know in some way you know that he would be the source of the future. Um, 
And so that there is that sense of, of, of the ego that, that's at work there. And that Noah is the one, paradoxically, who does experience some kind of menucha in the end, that he finds that place um, from which Toldot can, can spring up. Toldot is apparently, is, again, Toldot is used for the first time of Noah. You know, everyone else gave birth and Eva uh, Yoled, but the word Toldot used of a human being, Noah is the first person. And it's a very difficult balancing place that, that he finds, a pivoting point. And also with the whole plow business. Uh, so yes, the Midrash that uh, Noah invented the plow, but that you have made it, you have opened that whole thing up about the plow because every other uh, image you've given us today is all about plowing and Noah and the turning things over and the plowing and the opening things up. So just that little little comment about Noah bringing menucha or relief because he invented the plow, but then the entire image of the plow is today's lesson. I, it's just beautiful. It's huge. You know, it, that's what I mean by saying that the Torah is Shira. It's not that just that the Midrash is poetic. That's obvious that the Midrashim are, are poetic, that they do all kinds of plays with words and so on. But it's all there in a sense in the Torah. Now, that's something that I, I would like to, to try to show as we continue during the year, that there is a sense in which it's not just our ingenuity that is creating these patterns, but it's there. You know, somewhere, you know, God is in the text <laughs> um, it, without being too sentimental about it, but the, the words themselves ask for a poetic reading. And maybe one day you will comment on the arum of the nachash and the arumim of the... Double meanings everywhere, right next to each other. You know, what is the Torah trying to do? Thank you so much. Okay. So, um, yes, okay. So, I just, I just want to say, well, I just want to say that you never comment on the because we always start from Noah. I'll say again. Who is speaking? For you to comment, it's Dara. For you to comment on Arum, you would have yes. to start your parsha shiurim with Bereshit, but every well, year you start with Noah. That's right. That's right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank so you. Very nice to see your faces and names. <laughs> All the best. See you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.